Hello everyone, good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today and welcome to this webinar organized by School Education Gateway European Toolkit for Schools, which is running a webinar on promoting inclusive education and tackling early school leaving. So my name is Ina and together with my colleagues Ismini and Eleonora, we'll be, uh, we are delighted to support this first webinar of the series, which will be dedicated to family participation. So today we will focus on how schools can involve families in successful education actions and uh, to, Im to improve students learning and social and emotional development as well. In these times of educational emergency that we are living right now, it's extremely important to reduce the already existing learning and social inequalities. So we will also look into some practical questions today, practical examples from several EU funded research projects to see how families can be effectively involved in supporting their children education. So here you can see our speaker panel today. And um, so it's Rocio Garcia uh, Carrion. She's a research fellow at the University of Deusto. And her research includes inclusion of marginalized groups, family and community involvement. She has contributed to identifying evidence based uh, actions for inclusion and social cohesion. Uh, we also have Blanca Febre Lopez, and she's a secondary education teacher at the Sagrada Familia School, where she puts into practice different successful educational actions with strong family participation component. So I'm very curious to listen to our speakers today, and they will share some interesting practices. Um, and before giving the floor to our first speaker, Rocio, I would just like to point out that the session will be recorded, and the recording will be available on our web page uh, together with the slides of our speakers. In the meantime, if you have any questions, feel free to pose them in the group chat and we'll try to address as many as possible in the end of the presentation of our speakers. So um, I will just uh, give the floor to Rosia. Thank you. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm delighted to introduce this first part of our webinar, focus on family participation always matter, even more during uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. So uh, I would like to start to um, tell uh, all of you that um, we all know the challenges and the threats that the edu educational emergency stemming from the health crisis has posed to many schools, teachers, families, uh, and in particular to many children worldwide. But many of us do also know that even in the most difficult times, like the one we are living by now, research, science bring us hope and knowledge that is absolutely essential to improve people's lives. So today we want to make the most of this webinar to share with you some educational research that has achieved educational and social improvements against all the odds. Uh, what, what is most important that research is telling us at this moment is that what, with no question so ever is that learning and social inequalities that many children face worldwide can be preventable and can be reduced. Uh, for those who are born in poverty, they are not doomed to fail in a school. So they can, um, they can succeed, they can overcome those inequalities and family participation always matter. It's a crucial issue. But so what the research specifically is telling us, and I will introduce in these three parts of the presentation, is why should we involve families and communities in children education, why is that important, why that matters and for whom. And if we uh, acknowledge that that is important, how we can do it effectively across the schools in Europe and beyond, and even in the most challenging situation like the COVID-19 COVID pandemic, we can transform difficulties into opportunities, as uh, Blanca will let us know later on. So um, we start from what science is telling us regarding this topic, even in the most uh, difficult situation. So we know from educational research that from decades, family involvement, family participation can make a real difference and can improve education and children's lives in many diverse contexts. This is that the work of Joyce Epstein at John Hopkins University show many evidence on that, but the research of many other colleagues around the world told us that involving families uh, family involvement can improve children's cognitive and emotional development from early years, can improve academic achievement from many diverse uh, schools, uh, including 
children belonging to ethnic minorities and with minority background, and can also develop socialist, contribute to the development of social skills for those children. So there is a consensus on the importance of that uh, impact of family involvement. So the question here is if we know that that's important, and if some schools are actually showing that, that those results can be achieved, the critical question is how, how we can do it, how we can make the most of that family involvement to make a difference in children's lives. That poses a critical questions um, in terms of not providing those benefits from one kid and leading others out of that opportunity. So if we look at one of the most relevant studies in the field, one of the most cited and, and read it in the Cambridge Journal of Education, that was awarded by, uh, with the best paper prize. Uh, that longitudinal study conducted by Fletcher and Soler show that even Roma families and their children were, uh, which are one of the most systematically excluded populations in Europe and beyond, engaged successfully in a school during years and over years sustaining that improvement through dialogic learning. What that, what that school did, what is that, that uh, research show with that um, study? that opening the school to the entire community and engaging families and children in, in transformative interactions using dialogue to offer them an, oppor an, a, an opportunity to learn and to flourish together gave uh, that pathway for transformation in terms of re uh, reducing inequalities and improving academically and socially. What were the main results that they achieved in doing this research? So they show that ending with a school failure was possible by reducing and basically eradicating dropout, as you can see in the graph on the, on the right hand side, well, and increasing the enrollment of a student in the school. So in a period of a year, when uh, looking at the results in the standard evaluations, all the children in, from one year to another in, uh, achieve higher than the average in those standardized evaluations. So those kids were most of, most of them Roma and most of them uh, living in poverty. And those results are uh, remarkable, that improvements, but beyond the numbers, there were hundreds, thousands of children that benefited from that research. They were children like Maria, this girl, when before the research, she was 10 years old, and she was writing and reading with difficulties. And, but the dream in her school when she was 10 years old was doing well, was um, had, uh, graduating, graduating in secondary education in a situation with a father who spent eight years in prison. Even in, in that context was basically unimaginable that that dad could come out from the prison thanks to the collaboration of the teachers, of the head teachers and the social workers to support him to come into the school, to come into his, his children's class and volunteer in learning mathematics, in learning languages, in learning English, all the subjects, having a real participation at the core of their children's education, of his children's education. And after six years, she was graduating for and making that dream in secondary school. The result, uh, uh, what, how this was achieved, how that uh, participation of that father, among many others, were engaged in a school. That was the process of uh, uh, the, the research that we conducted and across uh, all Europe, that was the included project. The included project was the only research in socioeconomic sciences and humanities from the sixth framework program included in the list of the 10 success stories in European research, highlighted by the European Commission. And, and that research was included there because those results, like the ones we saw in Maria, in the case published in the Cambridge Journal of Education, were replicated across hundreds of schools in Europe, benefiting thousands of children and achieving a remarkable scientific, political, and most importantly, social impact that once the results of that research were implemented in data schools across many other, they achieve consistently those improvements in academic achievement, but also in social cohesion, making those systematically excluded part of an education that was actually making a difference 
against all the odds, like that community was suffering. So this way that we will look at in, in depth in the second part of this presentation was replicated, uh, showing that it was possible placing immigrant and minority family and community members at the heart of the school, at the center of the children's learning process. That was done across the schools in Europe in elementary, primary education, but maybe we have also teachers with us that are in secondary. So we show that with the similar patterns of uh, involving families in those successful educational actions, um, we, uh, we uh, provided evidence that it was possible to reduce early school living among uh, secondary students. And from that, um, that was one of the main results of the included project to identify those successful educational actions in which families and communities are engaged through dialogic learning, through dialogue and interaction, and was replicated, achieving the best results across many diverse contexts, from European schools to rural contexts, for example, in Colombia and across Latin American countries, where they have shown to improve mathematics or languages, among others, but having an impact on teachers who were striking for them, having experienced that amazing commitment of parents and children, when they had the opportunity to be involved in the learning processes, in, the, in those issues that are crucial for improved children education, beyond a touristic or folkloric participation, beyond going to the parties, beyond going to the informative meetings. So that approach, that successful educational actions are bringing those improvements currently to more than 9,000 schools in more uh, than in 14 countries across the world, showing that can those uh, learning and social inequalities that, that this health crisis and this educational emergency has raised can be reduced and can be prevented. That is one of the most um, important messages that science is telling us, that not all types of family involvement are uh, equally successful, have the same impact, but that we have the knowledge, we have the research knowledge to involve families and communities effectively. But as researchers who we work towards social impact to improve people's lives, we know that to know is not enough. We need to have that impact and we need to identify and provide the citizens, the society, the teachers, the families uh, with that how they can do it effectively. So we will move on to see some of the key um, aspects that these schools and any school in the world can do, even in the most difficult situation, uh, to engage those families effectively. One of the key uh, evidence that we have in the international scientific community, and, and there is a consensus, as for example, shown by the Center of Developing Child from Harvard University, is that uh, it's crucial for learning and development, the interactions that children have with the adults who care for, for, from, for them. So adults who care for the children are not only the teachers in a school, the, the interactions they have with their families, with other adults around, with the community, ha, are so important to transform those early interactions for years and that will have an impact across life span. So that has been defined as self and return interactions, those reciprocal interactions that build responsive relationship, caring relationship for those children and that are so embraced with the learning process. The schools that implement those successful educational actions open the opportunity for families to engage in those transformative interactions because we also know that many of them, those especially living in poverty, are having their children exposure to 30 million word gap, 30 million words of exposure of the children who are living in poverty than those from academic families. So, and we we want to work for guarantee that right of education to every single child without differentiating and perpetuating that gap that we know from classical studies that is already there. So the good news is if that is social, if that is part of the children's social context, schools can make schools, communities, interactions with families can make an enormous difference to uh, bridge that gap. 
And that is what, what these schools, like the one we will listen later, and all the schools who have been doing this research, are showing that it is possible to open those classrooms where uh, parents say they really like the idea to participate in their children's education, because they gave us the opportunity to have a real impact on children's educational outcomes. But as we said, and we know, not all interactions are equally effective. Authoritative interactions impose power relationships between teachers and families can, be a, can hinder families' participation. Instead, what we uh, analyze in the research and we observe in small groups when we're with parents supporting their kids when learning mathematics, when learning languages, when learning music, is that they interact through egalitarian dialogue, one of the key principles of that dialogic learning, which is a a enormous and marvelous, marvelous tool to uh, engage those families. So creating those spaces, supporting the children from giving arguments, giving the reasons, making them critical thinkers and, and learning and sharing that passion and that motivation for being part of their everyday life in the school, in the important things, in the learning, in their classrooms, had an enormous impact on learning mathematics, for example, for those kids that show that opening those classrooms and those schools to the dialogue with the entire community to create dialogic classrooms as this project in the FP7 framework program in the European Commission showed uh, was giving a message that we need to open the school to the dialogue with among the children, with the families, with productive and articulated reflections that engage in meaningful and in supportive relationships. To create those supportive relationships with the families among the children, we need another critical aspect, which is introducing help and solidarity interactions. To create that supportive and, and safe learning environments in the classrooms, we know that having diverse diversity of adults coming and volunteering promote inclusion of every child and success for all, but especially for those, those most vulnerable, like the ones belonging to ethnic minority or to immigrants. From that study uh, published in the Cambridge Journal of Education, we obtained those evidences. We knew that from those in most um, vulnerable situation, uh, those interactions were crucial, but we replicate those, um, those learning environments, those dialogic classrooms, opening to other uh, parents and families with from middle and high socioeconomic status without any particular problems. And again, we observe that in those contexts, when they engage in those productive and meaningful interactions, con um, behaviors of solidarity and of friendships were significantly, significantly improved, regardless to those who didn't have the opportunity to participate in those classrooms. So. Uh, what we see is those successful educational actions are bringing those improvements to those most vulnerable, but also to schools in Cambridge, in England, across many other uh, contexts with no particular problems in socio-economic issues. But why that is in, what is, why that is happening? What kind of interactions we need to offer, not only to the children, but also to the families? is um, what we observed recently is those help and guidance interaction, having the adults guiding the children in their mutual support, in their collaboration in learning, was definitely essential for achieving those improvements. That cannot be done without engaging those families in trust and based and confidence relationships. So more recently, to bridge that gap for those families who are um, disengaged, who has been suffering themselves from a school failure and who may feel that they don't have the tools or the skills to support their children. We have, um, we have in the research the opportunity to provide that framework for the schools. As a teachers, uh, we know if we work in a strong collaboration through that egalitarian dialogue among us as a teaching staff and communicate that approach to the families, we can move on building trust-based relationships, building that confidence, that uh, establishing that common goal, which is for the schools providing the best education for all children, so that the teachers, the same education that we want for our own kids, is that education we need to put 
at, uh, to offer to other people's children, to uh, the children we have in our schools, because it's a way to put in dialogic learning into work for all to learn and flourish. That is the opportunity that this framework gives us. And how that can be done, not only involving families in, uh, their, in their children's education, but offering opportunities for mothers, for fathers, to engage in educational processes that can have an impact on their own education. When the school is open to do, uh, to read and discuss the greatest literary works in literature, like the Odyssey, Romeo and Juliet, or the Arabian Nights, we uh, have uh, observed in that research that interactions between a school and home and transform. Children and families discuss at home about the books they are reading in the school, so the mothers can improve their motivation to help their children and they, and they themselves can are empowered and feel more confident to support them. So those transformative interactions regarding to academic issues in the school come to homes, enter into the kitchen, into the, um, into the dining rooms and the, the conversations, the interactions start to change. So in a situation like that, like the one we are now, those schools who were already engaged in those processes found much more opportunities and they have much more tools to deal with a crisis like the one we have been facing. So uh, as this mom say during the dinner, they speak about those books and they, she explained to the children, to her husband, some of the debates she has. The impact of these transformative interactions that make people empowered and committed to the school, to their children's education, has led them to dream and dream bigger. Even those um, Roma families who were engaged in this process, like Raquel, she is a mom of three kids. Uh, she left school when she was young and then dream to come back to university, to higher education, the first in her family, in her story, and dream to, to go to medical school. Now she is doing medical school, she is being a role model for the young kids coming, coming from a very poor background and being a Roma woman. So what, what research, what science is telling us, and if, if we put the families at the center of the educational processes and engage them in those successful educational actions, in those spaces in classroom and beyond, we can dismantle some of the educational myth that has been um, condemning and, and excluding children for so long, just because they belong to a families with no academic degree or just because they were, come from low socioeconomic status and that has been perpetuating the inequalities when we know now that are possible to transform. So now is the time, now we have the entire opportunities to transform difficulties into possibilities, even during this COVID pandemic that has had implication when schools have been closed and children have been without resources, confined at home, and families were facing those poverty, illness or violence, even though this interaction has been moving from schools to homes through the digital tools, through many pathways towards transformation to continue building the skills that all adults need for life. As a, as a teacher, maybe we can be very uh, worried about only thinking about our work is, our, is the children. Other people should care about adults. But the key message from Sarian is that if we want to transform learning and human development. We need dialogue and interaction, but we absolutely need to put into practice those strategies, those actions with the families. If we want to have an impact on the children, we need to care about how we work with the adults that, that are important for them, because otherwise we couldn't achieve those uh, uh, objectives and those results that every, every teacher wants uh, for, their, for their students to achieve the best. So the two key messages um, we can take from here is um, those processes of transformation and strongly embedded in the social context and depending on dialogue and interaction. And now we know how to provide those egalitarian spaces, those um, uh, trust-based relationship, engaging in those solidarity interaction where families and communities can improve, can, can transform the interactions at home and in the community 
to offer the best to all the children. So just to conclude, science is telling us that with that approach, as we have been seeing the, um, when monitoring the impact of research, as Ramon Fletcher was hired the chair for the, from the European Commission to evaluate and to design the indicators for all sciences to see how this research can actually have a social impact and can improve and move us towards achieving the sustainable development goals to ensure high quality, inclusive and high quality education for all. We have been seeing that that is possible through other projects across Europe and through tools that are already in our hands, like the European Toolkit for Schools that are providing us with those, with those evidence to make the dreams of many children, like Maria, to come true, even in the most difficult situation. That's the message of hope and of knowledge that can and actually is improving people's lives. And now we will um, continue with Blanca, who will let us know specific and concrete examples from the schools that are making this real and possible. Good afternoon. I'm Blanca Febre and a secondary school teacher. I will speak not only about the work in my school, I will also present some examples of different schools from the network of schools and teachers that are represented here. This is a group that is very diverse. I'm going to tell you the experiences that these schools have had during the COVID-19, including families for the improvement of education. We live in challenging times and we need more than ever to join forces to continue extending the quality of education. Because how can children foster social skills when they don't have the necessary social interactions? Or how can parents choose among learning, different learning environments when all the options have clear downsides? These concerns and choices are even more difficult for parents of children with disabilities who are among the most vulnerable students and who are at an increased risk of regression, especially during the school disruptions. As Rocio has just explained, interactions not only with the students but also with the entire educational community are essential to achieve the quality of education that every single child deserves with the aim of dialogue and transforming difficulties into possibilities a group of teachers, researchers, principals and headmasters and other people from the community we have been working together uh, to identify those actions that have contributed to fulfill these uh, three goals. On the one hand, increasing learning and providing quality education for all, including vulnerable groups, even when the education was being 100% online. Secondly, an attempt was made to encourage the creation and sense of community. And finally, to overcome the violence that can emerge even more easily than before. So the first question is, how can we improve learning involving families? The schools which know that the promotion of context of interaction has a radical influence on the quality of learning have tackled a very important challenge. These schools already had established dialogic uh, strategies in their schools. Some of them, are, for example, my school, were participating in Erasmus Plus programs to enlarge successful educational actions through Europe. So um, it was much easier to move these into the virtual or into the, the online. And when this, when this happened, we, re, we found out that we were open indoors, not only to the students, but also to the, to the families, uh, families that had never before been involved in these uh, um, logic spaces, began to share these spaces with their children, teachers and the community. So these dialogical spaces were even more diverse and rich. The children in this photo are participating in a dialogic literary gathering. In them, 
they read the best books of the universal literature. Here, for example, they are reading around the world in 18 days. But these, but they also read uh, books as Romeo and Juliet or The Odyssey or Don Quixote. And then they share their meanings, interpretations, arguments, reflections following the seven principles of the dialogic learning. If we want to impact at home, we need to connect with the homes that make this possible. And if we want to connect with them, we also have to give them voice. They have to know that they are very important for us, that they are very important for the education of the children and that their opinions matter. Families report how the preparation and the participation in the dialogic literary gatherings have a strength parent-child bonds. We can see this in these two quotes. For example, Danny, a child, said, I like that he, his father, tells me, uh, because sometimes I learn things from what he says, I ask him the meaning of a word, and I also learn things from what he explains to me. And Maria, a mother, says, from the first moment you have to sit down to read a story, starting with the bond you have to create as a mother doctor to prepare it. Then you can integrate those explanations into your conversations uh, with your children, and that's good because it helps you to talk more with them. Another example was carried out by some schools of them in Valencia and a high school that is San Juan Bosco that is in Murcia. They are all of them schools which implemented a successful educational actions before the confinement. So they started to move them into the online. So they promoted uh, what we call dialogic workspaces online. They are small groups of students and uh, they are connected through video conferences and they are working together uh, to solve some activities or, or homework with an adult person. This adult person can be or a teacher or a volunteer. This adult develops a fundamental role. On the one hand, he facilitates the interactions among students to promote uh, that they solve the tasks together and helping each other. Uh, on the other hand, he or she ensures quality and respectful interactions. Uh, this, that could be an individual work in most of the schools, becomes an open space uh, with classmates, with, uh, with adults and uh, with other persons from the community. Uh, so they can work together in a safe and supportive environment. And all this generates important improvements of um, children. For example, this mother told us about her son's improvement. Marta, his, her, the mom, says, I am very happy to participate. I think we are doing a very good job together. I like it very much how you have organized the program of the school without the school. And I think that my son, Pao, is maturing a lot. You can imagine, he has reached a lot of autonomy. A clear example of how these actions work in vulnerable groups is this school. Uh, they have about 90% uh, of Romani students, all of them at risk of regression. It is called Santiago Apostol School and it is located in the Cabañal neighborhood in Valencia. Their experience uh, was published in the web of European Toolkits uh, for Schools. This school managed to connect with the community and through the creation of the logical uh, context of participation, they were able to uh, create synergies with the community, with teachers, with social services and uh, with the whole society. And, and they achieve uh, devices for all the students, but not only the devices. 
they also achieve a connection to the to the internet and once that they were all connected uh, they could continue recreating these uh, dialogic spaces that are the basis of uh, their learning in this uh, this is uh, another very interesting school that belongs to the network and it is a specific school for children with disabilities and with uh, very special needs. They also have some Romani students and it is located in Cheste near Valencia. Uh, during the confinement, more families were participating, uh, the families who were with them in the dialogic the literary gatherings underline the great benefits that these virtual dialogic spaces have had for the children. The fact of being online um, may have provided them the, the opportunity to open up and to express their opinions uh, without shyness. An example that one of the teachers, Eva, told us was about a girl with a special educational needs who did not use to participate in dialogic literary gatherings when they were in a face-to-face -face class. But when they started to be online, uh, the girl was involved and, and gave her opinion much more frequently. Uh, Eva, the teacher, told us, I have realized that maybe as everyone is at home in front of their screen, they feel more confident and children who did not used to participate so much in the face-to-face -face classes, they participate a lot now. The same observation is expressed by her mother. Luisa says, I think that the days when I can participate in the DLGs, she interacts more, she feels much happier. Um, this is uh, another example of how to transform difficulties into possibilities. This is the voice of a, of a headmaster. Uh, she is Monica and she uh, works in, in Catalonia in, in a school called Ciudad, del Jardín, Ciudad Jardín. They know that this context of interaction are the key to better learning. Many schools have chosen to stop doing them. However, they have chosen to do them, but with maximum security, sometimes online or sometimes um, maintaining social distance. But they continue uh, interacting as much as possible. And Monica said, we try to introduce a lot of security in what we do. We transmit confidence to the families. In this way, we have even more family participation than before. Are no more cases of infection than in other schools. I believe that the key is not to stop doing things. We have to do them by, by transferring it to the online world. We are creating synergies that did not exist before and even changing relationships for the better. What is also relevant from this school is that they, tr they train the volunteers who participate at the school not only on how to promote uh, quality interactions, but also in health COVID-19 prevention. And they have also created a mixed commission which manages the COVID-19 issues. The next question would be how to uh, promote a sense of community. In some of these schools, as for example, a, schools, um, a school called uh, Jaume I de Catarroja or Camp Turia in Ribarroja, uh, they are both located near Valencia. Uh, there were already mixed commission. These mixed commissions involve students, families and teachers uh, to improve uh, the school in any way. But during the period of confinement, new ones appear, especially COVID-19 committees. These volunteers, most of them were family members, contributed to many tasks, including the ones we have here in the slide. These families were in touch with other families just to check that everything was going well 
and they gave the information about the grants and financial aids. They also uh, tried to check that the, the, the students had the, the necessary devices or if uh, they didn't, they tried to get some from, from the school and they also were checking that they had access to supportive relationships. And this is the story of a teacher who works in a school which has uh, approximately 80% uh, of Romani students. She at first could only make contact uh, to the students by phone or by WhatsApp. After talking to a Romani girl all week, she could see how her appearance had changed for the better. Uh, she received a photo uh, the first day and then she received uh, another photo the next Friday. Uh, in the last photo, she was clean, she was well dressed and she seemed happy. And this was in great contrast uh, to the first day. Laura said, at first I tried to keep in touch through WhatsApp, by telephone. I began to establish contact with families and students. One girl wanted to send me a photo on Tuesday and then another on Friday. In the photo, you could see everything. There was a big difference between the photo she sent on Tuesday and the one on Friday. And I was very excited because you could see the change in the photos, the brightness on the face, how good she was feeling. She was happy, pretty because we were in touch again. Many families had lost contact with the school and therefore did not have access to the aids. This teacher helped the families to fill in all the necessary papers to apply for the aids. In other schools, uh, mixed commissions did it. They helped the families and these actions made the school more meaningful again for them. And in this way, more families participated from these dialogical spaces. This is also the voice of a headmaster who has managed to increase community participation in, time, in times of COVID, perhaps the key uh, to transforming difficulties into possibilities is this, that with maximum security, not to say no to anything. She says, we have not said no to anything. We have simply asked ourselves how we can do this in order to continue to implement successful educational actions. What do we have to change to maintain the interaction between the educational community? And the third question would be, how can we prevent violence in this online context? Possibly the key is training families and teachers to create these safe environments. Dialogic pedagogical gatherings with teachers and community have been the key, the key in promoting these safe uh, dialogical spaces free of violence, in which research papers published in the highest uh, journals have been read providing the educational community the necessary tools for interactions to go in the same direction. Because we know that sometimes uh, when at the school we say something and then they listen to a different thing at home. So when, when the, this interaction uh, go in the same direction, we have more impact on students. So, this is uh, the explanation of one of the participants. It is an action that helps us to learn and transform our educational practice. It is a very important moment because we share the learning, we meet and reflect on how to improve our actions at this time. Now we have read the chapters on the prevention of violence and friendship from one of the guides of the Child Study Center of Yale University. We were able to think about the importance of doing these actions very well if violent situations arise, arise, pardon, arise among our students in their families during confinement. 
it is also very interesting that from different associations that defend evidence-based education, dialogic pedagogical webinars are being attended by teachers, families and volunteers all over the country. People from different regions of Spain have been participating and more than 400 uh, teachers were registered. Uh, the dialogue has taken place around research papers published in the best journals to address current problems derived from the COVID situation. In the poster, we can see uh, the webinars and their topics. For example, in the first one, we read Harvard's recommendations to promote a safe return to school. One of the participants in this webinar commented, it is important to make plans in case of a new confinement in order to guarantee equity at all levels, food, internet, connections, sanitary materi material. The second we read was the, the effects of the use of technology on children's empathy and attention. And uh, we will continue. The next will be schools that open doors to prevent child abuse during COVID-19 confinement. And we will finish with, the, with this one that is promoting safe sexual relationship among adolescents in the 19 era. Thanks to, to, to all this training, uh, different groups of families, teachers, lunch monitors and volunteers who know the importance of promoting a violence free environments were in charge of fostering a sense of community to fight the isolation of some families. They do this by, by energizing the, the social network with positive messages of solidarity um, by organizing uh, online activities such as, for example, debates or, or films clubs, where films were discussed. Uh, the teacher of this school that is called La Scolaica, um, Sara, uh, explained that through this group, uh, they want to promote relationships of support and friendship to, to ensure that no child was left alone. And to conclude, I would like to do so with, uh, with the quote from Magda, that she is uh, the principal in, in the specific school that I was telling you before. Um, it is clear, I think that this is a, a clear example of how to break with the language of complain to move to the language of possibility, to create new actions that a school incorporates after the experience of confinement, to continue to take steps in working with the community. She says, for us, this confinement has been a gift to be able to participate with all the families at the same time, having the opportunity to do DLGs with another school, I never imagined that we could do this from home and with their families that we could be interconnected. And now I think about it and I say, why not? It is so enriching and I think that this does open up views of a good future. We love each other so much and we put up the barrier that we are far away. We have other tools, so for, this to, for these tools, that are the new technologies, we can go virtually to our school and forget about the pain of the distance. We can have virtual volunteers, virtual families, and to take the DLGs outside the school hours. And we will do them at the time that everyone can, and we will meet again. Thank you very much for your attention. We are expecting some questions uh, to our speakers, so please feel free to pose them in the chat box. In the meantime, I already have uh, one question to our speak one question to our speaker, uh, which sounds like how the school can be a hub to make science closer to the families. Uh, it's always important, but uh, even more during the pandemic. Yeah. If anyone wants to, Rocio, would you like to answer? 
Okay, I can contribute and then Blanca can, can say also. Uh, well, it's definitely an opportunity and even more important during this time that um, if, if the schools like the research we have presented and, the, and the, all the examples that Blanca has just said, uh, when the teachers access to the research, which is in open access and, and can be easily discussed by them and integrated in their everyday practices, opening the school and involving the families and, and sharing with them the arguments why that is having an impact and making them aware and empower them as a, um, also contributors and, and, and protagonists of that process. They can be one, one of the more important allies that we have to extend from the science that we have been incorporating in the schools and is a, an amazing movement of schools and teachers across Europe, um, then to extend beyond that. The, one of the movements that is currently uh, representing this approach in Europe is one of the projects I, I mentioned very briefly, but um, I would like to, to, to share with the people, which is Steps for SIAS, which is making steps for successful educational actions. And every teacher, every family can uh, register in that and, and join that and can be uh, getting closer to, to, ex to, to real examples that are already doing it. So that would be my point on that if we have time for other questions. Thanks. Thank you so much, uh, Rocio. Yes, we have a couple of more questions coming in. Uh, so the question, the next question um, is, who are these schools and what kind of training are they given? Well, uh, the schools are a network of schools. Uh, we belong to a network. Uh, all of us uh, uh, belong to the seminars on the shoulders uh, of GNs. And in these seminars, we are trained uh, reading the most important pedagogical books uh, written. So that's why our name is on the shoulders of GN. And we also uh, do it through pedagogical, uh, literary, uh, pedagogical dialogic gatherings. And in here, we discuss about these books and, and and we also are uh, try we, we are um, being trained in in uh, aspects as for example the importance of, of friendship and to prevent violence and other topics like that so uh, the most important is that uh, we read uh, these uh, research papers that are the best uh, published in the journals, and and we are trying to 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 talk always uh, around these uh, these uh, important research. One one aspect on that point that Blanca was commenting on the training uh, is so important: the partnership that we do from research uh, from researchers from universities with the schools together. Uh, to bring the, the, um, the best empirical evidence that we have so far um, to extend and to share that in the teacher training. So unfortunately, as we know, uh, the, the most effective teacher training programs are those uh, who are based on evidence-based education. And luckily now we have a lot of resources on that. So the commitment of the researchers, we, we collaborate and we work together with the, with the teachers is in professional development workshops from that dialogic approach and bringing uh, the, those evidence we have provided to report social impact. Not only, not every every research can be very descriptive or can be just commenting on, on what is reproducing what we know, but the, the approach of the trainings provide those um, evidence they, which have had social impact and doing collaboratively, involving as well the families in the teacher training, in the training themselves to make a stronger collaborations, as Blanca was saying, in the discussions and in sharing that common view and that uh, common purpose of, of what we are doing. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot to both Rocio and uh, Blanca for your answer. And we have a next question. Um, so one of our participants says it's very inspiring. And thank you very much, Rocio and Blanca. And I was wondering if teachers show barriers to the participation of families and vulnerable families specifically. And if this is the case, how can it be overcome? Yeah. That's a very important question. Maybe I can share what we know from research and then Blanca can um, add something from, from the experience. Um, well, yeah, I mean, um, 
uh, we have been experiencing sometimes that barriers to to deal with and to, to open the class for traditionally schools have been in many cases and, and still across many countries close to that because of that fear and, and teachers are sometimes reluctant to that but it's important two things one bringing those scientific evidence uh, if they do if they try and they have and now we have plenty of data and plenty of experiences as, as the network we mentioned in Europe that teachers who dare to open their classrooms, to dare to change their interactions and to, it, it implies we need to, re to, re to check what we have been doing so far and how we have been approaching families. Sometimes teachers said, how can I involve families in my class if, if they don't come to the meeting? But then we need to rethink how we are approaching them. We are inviting them just to listen what we have to say as a teachers, or are, or are making them um, make participants in decision makings for their children's lives. And most importantly, when the teachers see the impact of those actions, the improve the real improvements on, on the kids and on the families, that is a change. That is a turning point. That is a change in this this these practices and this evidence we have reported. Uh, are possible because there are improvements. So that uh, view is always in children improvements. In, in children improvements is something that can contribute to overcome those resistances. So to show the teacher that this is possible, as example what we face, and then once they do according what the research has the research has shown, they can experience themselves those successes, those those little successes that can become enormous as we have been seeing. Yeah, yeah. From from my experience, uh, I could say that uh, the most important thing is training. And once we have this training, and when you dare to open the your class, uh, uh, you you don't change it anymore because uh, we we need we really need help to attend the the diversity that we have in in our. Uh, classes, so we need to open them. We need uh, the help of the families. We need them. Um, uh, I think that we can open uh, those doors in in very different ways. Uh, we can we can give training to the families. Uh, we can have them as volunteers, or for example, uh, in some of these schools. Uh, and we have been training the families because they had difficulties with the technology during the confinement. So one of the ways is to open the school just to train them. And so they could be trained in this, that it was a need for them. And we also have opened the school, for example, to to lend them some devices and some materials because some of these uh, students didn't have these uh, these uh, uh, devices, okay? And we have also keep in contact with them um, uh, by telephone and or, or just um, uh, trying to to be connected to to all of them. And and I think I think that this is very necessary because uh, we need them at the school and and they are very important for for the improvement of the of the education. Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks a lot, Rocio and Blanca, for your answer. And uh, we are running already a bit late, so I'll just address one last question because I see there is a strong interest uh, in the topic. So the last question is, um, who are the volunteers that worked for the projects? Families, retired teachers, who are these? <laughs> Mm, well, uh, the volunteers, uh, most of the volunteers uh, uh, that we have are families, but uh, sometimes, uh, for example, in some schools, we, we also have uh, ex-students that uh, come back to the school now as volunteers uh, because some of them are in love with the project. And uh, we also have trainee teachers sometimes or other people for the community, uh, people from, from the neighborhood also uh, participate in, in these uh, dialogic uh, spaces. Mm -hmm. Yes, Rocio? 
Yeah, yes, as, as Lanka said, the more diversity we have in the volunteers, the better for the children because they engage to interact with many diverse people in different ways of talking or feeling or communicating emotions. And, and we have seen that diversity of volunteers and uh, the way that the community is mobilized. But uh, any any person who's committed with the project and, and bringing those high expectations and, and that willingness to improve children's lives can be a volunteer. So it's in a way to reducing stereotypes and to tearing down elitism to to the, the, the adults that are living around the children. So as, as Lanka said, that diversity on, on volunteers is really important. Excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, so I think we will draw this webinar to the end. Um, even though it was a really, uh, yeah, it was really a really fruitful webinar and I truly believe that our audience enjoyed it a lot. Uh, I could see very positive feedback in the chat box. So uh, I want to thank our speakers and all organizers for making this webinar uh, such an interesting uh, contribution. So thanks again for joining us today. Thanks uh, to speakers for such a, a great contribution and for our audience to be together uh, with us. Uh, today, thank you so much and have a wonderful evening. Goodbye.